Some other problems are things like framing effects. And we've looked at this, in fact, one of the, the recent assignments that you had with an article by Hardesty et al. looked specifically at framing effects. Whether something uh, was called a tax or whether it was called uh, a, a surcharge or an offset, okay, just the, the specific wording that you're using and the way that you're framing different response options can often have a dramatic effect. And some of you that have already had Cognitive Psychology 271 have seen examples of this as well. And again, we can discuss some more of these in class. Okay, the main point being that even getting at the exact same question content, the specific way that you're phrasing this item can often have a dramatic effect on the way that it's responded. Even just asking whether you approve with, say, a political figure's stance or disapprove with their stance, again, can, can, can lead to a subtle sort of framing effect as well. So writing good questions, what are some other key points to think about when you're writing good questions? Okay, just some sort of general advice. First of all, you want to avoid jargon, slang, abbreviations, all of these sorts of things, right? Okay, these are things you want to avoid to make sure that your participants are understanding the question clearly and in the same way that you intend them to. And in particular, that each individual respondent is perceiving the same thing when reading the same question. That is that you're achieving consistency, reliability in the way that participants are viewing your questions. The second important thing to understand is you want to write questions to actually test your hypotheses, of course. But if you're not careful, what you might end up doing is writing questions about your hypotheses in particular. Let's look at an example of this. I might want to know whether or not college students think that going on one date makes a relationship exclusive or not. Well, if I wanted to test this hypothesis, what I would want to do, of course, is to ask people this question, see whether or not people agree or disagree, and then collect data across enough college students. In fact, we've asked you guys this exact question and collected this data. Now, what is the wrong way to go about this? Well, I don't want to write a question about the hypothesis. And what would that look like? What if I said, agree or disagree with the following statement? College students believe that going on one date makes a relationship exclusive. Again, this is exactly what I want to find out, but I don't want to know whether or not each of you guys thinks college students believe this or not. I want to know whether you guys really do believe this or not. So again, what I am not trying to find out is what are your intuitions about other college students, but I want to ask the question directly to find out the answer directly from you guys. Another important thing to keep in mind is to have realistic expectations of your respondents' capabilities. Okay, you can't ask people to forecast events into the future, of course. And you can't ask them about something that happened to them when they were three or four years old. Recall your earliest childhood memory of something or other. Okay, a lot of times, what you're going to get in these instances is a lot of make-believe. People just can't realistically be expected to recall memories from that far in the past. By and large, people aren't going to be able to recall specific instances or specific time points. What exactly were you wearing last Wednesday? Or what was the first place that you went after your last class of the day on the second week of class Thursday? Okay, you can't ask people to recall very specific instances of things oftentimes, okay? So you have to be careful uh, in, in terms of, of asking questions of that nature. Finally, you want to avoid negatively phrased questions, okay, by and large. And in particular, you like to especially avoid questions that have double, tri triple negatives in some of these things. So, do you disagree with the statement that it's not fair to disallow people to avoid protesting this specific issue on Miami's campus? Okay, if I'm throwing three or four different negatives in there, it's hard to really understand what is it I'm really asking people. Okay, typically what you can do is to think about frame or er, asking the question in a way that's much more direct and much more clear without using these types of negative phrases. If you're confident that you uh, have selected from among the different question types and chosen the correct types to answer different content questions on your survey, and you're also confident that the way that you've worded these questions, the response options that you've given people, and so forth and so on, are all adequate and don't contain any inherent biases in your survey design, then the final thing you need to consider is in what order are you going to ask people these questions on your survey? Okay. Now, the first of these are just some very basic organizational concerns. What sort of questions do you want to start and end your survey with? 
And Jackson gives some advice about this as well, especially in terms of asking demographic questions at the end, which is a common recommendation. You don't want to start out with the very first question on your survey being something about some very sensitive topic or very private topic or a very controversial topic that's going to turn people off or get them charged up right away at the very beginning of your survey. Okay, You want to sort of uh, slowly lead into those types of questions after asking people maybe a few more innocuous questions at the start. But you also want to have a smooth flow to your survey. Okay? And in particular, what you can do is to uh, examine content relationships across the questions. So in other words, you know, keeping questions that are of similar content and that have similar subjects and group those together um, to have a nice smooth, smooth flow to your survey. Another thing to think about uh, in terms of some of the, the ordering effects that you might see okay, are contextual effects that might occur because of the fact that people are going to be answering your questions in sequence. Well, what do I mean by that? Again, the thing to think about here is that the way that people answer one question may have an effect on the way they interpret the following question. Or even just the fact that you've asked a specific question might cause people to think a little bit differently about the following question. Okay, so if you ask people a question about, um, are oil companies evil? Okay, or get them to, to conjure up this sort of an image on one question. Well, if in the very next question you ask them about how likely they would be to engage in some sort of environmentally friendly behavior, okay, because you've asked this first question about the evil oil companies and you've sort of set the mood in that sense, then the very next question you're asking them about their own environmental behaviors, they're not going to want to feel convicted or, or, or contradicted okay, in any sort of way in terms of the response to that second question. And so their response on that second question might be influenced and it might not be accurate just because of the contextual effect that you've set up with the first question. Or similarly, if you ask people about something like corporate greed, and then following that you ask them about whether or not they'd be uh, willing to volunteer to some specific cause or donate to some specific cause, or maybe support some sort of um, social program, for example. Again, their response then might be biased by the fact that they just... Uh, you know, indicted uh, corporations for being greedy, they're not going to want to seem greedy themselves on that following question, and therefore they may not reveal their true attitude towards that question as a result. Okay. Now, finally, the thing to think about is the, the natural rating dependencies that people are going to have uh, uh, and when they're filling out these types of surveys. Okay. So, in other words, if, if they are supposed to rate something on a scale of 1 to 10, imagine that what you're doing is rating uh, a set of faces on attractiveness, scale of 1 to 10. And you're in a, a situation where you're rating a total of 50 different faces. Well, the first few faces that you see, even if there's one that's quite attractive in there, you're probably not going to rate it as a 10, okay? because it's one of the very first few faces that you've seen. So you might rate this attractive face as an 8 or a 7. Well, now what you've sort of done is set the standard. Now that this face represents an 8 or a 7, you're going to be judging subsequent faces based on how it compares to that one that you've already judged. So in this case, if you never see one that's more attractive than that 7 or 8, you're never going to rate anything as a 9 or 10. Okay? Whereas if this face would have, this exact same face that you rated as a 7 or an 8 would have come very much later in the survey, now you might have been able to rate it as a 9 or 10 because relative to the other faces you've seen, which you might have then rated as a 7 or 8, some of these other less attractive faces, okay? now you might be able to rate this higher. So in other words, that when people are responding to these things, sort of the range of the rating scale that they're using on some of these items can be established very early on on some of the first stimuli that they're seeing. And so especially for longer types of surveys, this is something important to keep in mind. And with any of the sort of biases or things that we've talked about here, again, what you guys may want to start thinking about, because what we are going to discuss and, and do some work on in class this coming week, is to think about how we might counteract some of these things. So again, we'll talk about some of these solutions. This is exactly what we're going to want to accomplish this week so that you guys feel confident in creating your own surveys to conduct study to examining helping behavior in a little bit more detail. For now, at least, though, you guys should have enough familiarity with the basic concepts, at least to complete Quiz 11 that is now online and ready to be completed, and to have a good foundation of these concepts so that we can start applying them in class this coming week.